Uh, this sign is posted near the uh, entrance to the ruins at Qumran. And we're going to take a walk actually beginning at the top, overlooking the Dead Sea. So where these people are as we begin our downward descent into the wadi itself, wadi or meaning the little valley or gulch, Wadi Qumran, that's the name of it. We're going to descend by some of the caves and come out on this little plateau that extends outward, made of this marl, in which Qumran Cave 4 is found and on which are found the ruins that can be seen today. You can see there's the Dead Sea, and this is the country of Jordan right over here. The Jordanian Mountains. The Dead Sea at one time used to come all the way into here. And you can see there's some irrigation that's taking place down there. Now that's down below. We're up on the cliffs here. And as we begin our descent, you can see already marks of the erosion uh, over the years. It only rains a couple of times a year, and the water rushes through the wadi and cascades down below, and this water would then be collected and gathered in cisterns and in mikvahot, that is baptistries, for liturgical use. Next. Now you can see some more of the erosion. Next. It's a good shot right straight through there to see the Dead Sea. Next. Next. Ah, now, this is a little bit of photographic um, um, skill. I think we climb into a cave and take a look outside, and, and our picture is framed by the cave. This is the bottom of the wadi. It's just sand. And it, the water, when it rushes through here, empties out into this basin and winds up here in the Dead Sea. Now, that's Cave 4 right there, the back side of it. And here is a viewing place. And so this, this where my light is, that is the top of a marl. The, the marl juts out here, K4, back door. The front door is on the other side of that marl. And then here are the ruins themselves over in here. This little oasis here is actually a gift shop and snack bar. Here, <laughs> now that's, that's not original. That's not authentic. <laughs> The street here, this is, uh, comes over here to the highway that runs along the edge of the Dead Sea. Anyway, next. <coughs> now we're a little closer, and we can see, there, there again is the oasis. There's the little viewing place. It's just a little bench with the roof over it. And again, the back side of Cave 4. Next. Now, we're just about to, out of the cliffs. We've zigzagged our way through here. And we look back and we see a cave here. And you will actually see various caves in different locations throughout. Not all of these caves contain scrolls. Some <coughs> did. Next. <coughs> That's, there's the pathway as we continue our descent. Next. Uh, now, we've, we've gotten down to the, the marl on which the ruins are placed. We are now standing quite close to the viewing center, that little place where there's a bench and a roof over our heads. That is Cave 4. And this is the chimney, or the skylight, as it's variously referred to. It's a little easier to get into this cave through the top and drop down into it, rather than try to come up the side. This is steep, and this is very unsure grip this is very sandy stone, and it breaks off and slides away very easily. And one could be seriously hurt to go stumbling and sliding down that embankment. Anyway, that is Cave 4. It's, it's artificial. It was chiseled out. And this is the cave that was trashed by the Romans in 68 AD when they captured the site. The chimney up here is, is how Professor Allison Trites gained access <laughs> without authorization in 1964. Now, to his credit, uh, the barbed wire fence, which would be right about up here somewhere, was no longer, was not in place yet. But it was because of people like him, they felt they had to. <laughs> Next. 
<laughs> ah, now, this is what it's like inside the cave. And there's one of the uh, workers. Uh, it's not quite all cleaned out yet, but this is activity taking place inside cave four. <coughs> Next. That's the back side. Someone else who took this picture, I won't say who, has slipped around the fence and is being waved angrily to come back where he's supposed to be, but not until he got a shot at the back side of K4. And you can see that, you know, this is dangerous. You could fall down this and wind up down in the sandy bed of the wadi below. Next. And if you turn and look back, uh, you can see here's this sandy basin of the uh, wadi where a dead end is going back toward the cliffs. Right here. And in this direction, of course, one is looking west. And in the other picture, going this way, one is looking east toward the Dead Sea and toward Jordan. Next. And at the bottom of the wadi, again, looking up into the cliffs where the water comes cascading down whenever it rains. Next. There's a cave. Looking up the cliff. Next. Now we're going to enter the ruins themselves, and this legend is posted today. And where it's blue, this means water. And you can see up here there's an aqueduct. The water is carried into the community, and it is in various ways channeled throughout this network. And so you have holding tanks for water, but you also have baptistries, as we will see. Or, uh, a baptistry in Hebrew is mikvah, or the plural mikvahot. And so they, they did daily ritual bathing at this community. Now, this is a bird's eye view of what we think the community looked like when it was all assembled and put together. Next. There is, uh, this is the biggest part of the ruins that can be seen. You actually have the full one story still standing. Otherwise, it's mostly like this, just two or three feet of wall scattered throughout this area. Now, if we continue going in this direction, we'd eventually get to the place where you can look across uh, the gulch to K4. Next. Now, here are the steps, well preserved, of one of the mikvah. Uh, this is plaster that you're looking at, plaster over the stonework underneath. An earthquake damaged it. You can see what's happened. This is all broken away in here. But look at the the little guide, the little guides that come down here. You go down one side, ritually impure, and you emerge on the other side, purified. Next. And another shot of the ruins. Uh, this is from that one-story portion of building still standing. But over here is the wall that separates the living quarters from the cemetery over here. It was right, right about here along the wall. I don't know the precise location, but somewhere along, along in here, I'm told, that a, an ostracon was found that is a piece of pottery on which was written a list of property that ha evidently had been given to the yachad, to the community. And although some do dispute this reading, yachad, most accept it, yachad means community, and this is the name that the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes, give themselves. They are the community, the community of the renewed covenant. And so here we actually have a piece of hard evidence at the ruins a piece of hard evidence that links the ruins with the scrolls, particularly 1QS, that is the rule scroll from Cave 1. Very exciting uh, piece of archaeological discovery, only made a few years ago, I think it was in 94 or 95, that that ostracon was discovered. Next. Here, of course, is what it's all about. That is, I believe, 1QS, one frame of it. And you can see, that's, that's pretty legible. At the bottom of the scroll, um, you know, there's some damage like this. Occasionally there's a wormhole. But uh, the scrolls found in the jars in Cave 1 are in this kind of condition. In fact, you can even see the tracings printed into the le leather so that the scribe could hang his letters from these lines as he wrote from right to left. And by the way, if you've never studied Hebrew, 
uh, it is instinctive for non-Hebrew students to take Hebrew text and turn it upside down. And I've seen some funny things, some embarrassing things. In fact, on one occasion, my picture was put in a magazine and the photographer did a backdrop where he took <coughs> columns of Hebrew text as sort of background behind me and sure enough, he put the Hebrew upside down. And that was kind of embarrassing. There I am standing there trying to look intelligent, and the Hebrew is upside down. But that is because unlike English, Hebrew hangs from these lines. And you can see the lines, I think they're up here too. So they hang from the line, whereas we tend to stack our letters on the line. Okay, well that's enough of our pictorial introduction. Gives you a little bit of an overview of, of, of what all is involved. It's a most inhospitable country. I cannot imagine working there in the summer. I've only been at the Dead Sea on one occasion in the summer, in the middle of July. And uh, we arrived when it was sundown, around 9 p.m. And uh, we were to view the caves with lights shining on them. And it was, of course, very enchanting. But uh, even though it was 9 p.m., dark, it was the middle of July, and it was horribly hot, close to uh, probably 35 Celsius, something like that, and the wind was blowing, and it had a very drying effect. And I I'm not exaggerating when I say I think I drank a half a gallon of water uh, while I was there. They kept uh, supplying us with water just to keep us from drying out as we tried to eat our dinner and listen to wonderful music and listen to uh, unending speeches. And, and enjoy the whole program. This was uh, two summers ago. Uh, summer is not the time to be at the Dead Sea. There are several texts I would like to look at uh, this evening. Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, Part 2, 4Q525, the Beatitudes text, 4Q400 to 405, the Songs of the Sabbath, the Cairo Damascus document, abbreviated usually CD, 4Q500, the Vineyard text, and 4Q285, a supplement to the Messianic War, the War Rule, as it's sometimes called. Now, prior to the discovery of 4Q25, there really was no analogy to Jesus' collection of Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount and its close parallel, the Sermon on the Plain, in Luke 6. Sirach 14, 20 to 27, was sometimes pointed out. It begins, blessed is the man who meditates on wisdom. However, that is the only occurrence of blessed. It goes on for several verses, but it isn't a string of blessings or macarisms, as it's sometimes called, as we have with Jesus' own Beatitudes in Matthew 5 and Luke 6. Sometimes appeal is made to the book of Sirach, chapter 25, verses 7 to 11. But again, there's only one occurrence of blessed. When we found 4Q 525, we now had another text from antiquity, from about one generation or so before Jesus, that has a string of beatitudes, and I will read them. Blessed is he who walks with a pure heart, and who does not slander with his tongue. Blessed are they that hold fast to her, referring to wisdom, to her laws, and do not hold to the ways of evil. Blessed are they who rejoice in her, and do not overflow with the ways of folly. Blessed are they who ask for her with clean hands, and do not seek her with a deceitful heart. Blessed is the man who grasps hold of wisdom, and walks in the Torah of the Most High, and directs his heart to her ways, and restrains himself with her disciplines and always accepts her chastisements, and does not cast her off in the misery of his afflictions, nor forsake her in a time of trouble, nor forget her in days of terror, and in the meekness of his soul does not despise her, but rather always meditates on her, and when in affliction occupies himself with Torah, who all his life meditates on her, and places her continually before his eyes, so he will not walk in the ways of evil. Now these, this string of beatitudes parallels, in some ways, the string of Beatitudes that we find in Matthew 5 and Luke 6. But it is different in a very important way. This string of Beatitudes, just like the Beatitudes we found in Sirach 24 and 20, 
and uh, uh, 14 and 25, these Beatitudes are focused on wisdom. And there is the difference. Jesus' Beatitudes are focused more on eschatology. <clears throat> to read a few of the Beatitudes from Luke chapter 6, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you that hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. There is an eschatological orientation in Jesus' Beatitudes that you do not find in 4Q 525 or in Sirach 14 or 25. And so what we have here then, once again, we have a scroll that illustrates the way something was done or could be done in Jesus' day, and yet at the same time highlights the distinctiveness in Jesus' teaching. Stringing together Beatitudes, nothing unusual about that at all. But Beatitudes that are focused not on wisdom, actually, but rather focused on the kingdom of God, focused on eschatology, focused on something that will take place in the future, that appears to be distinctive of Jesus and is entirely consistent with his proclamation of the kingdom of God. A second example, 4Q 400 to 405, these six texts, along with some similar texts found at Masada, celebrate the Sabbath, songs of the, of the Sabbath sacrifice. Now what's interesting about these texts is that there is reference made to the kingdom. Now some have tried to argue, perhaps best known, Burton Mack in a recent book has tried to argue that the idea of kingdom of God grows out of Hellenism, not really out of Judaism. So he argues, for example, that the exact phrase, ho theos, uh, uh, hey tu theu, the kingdom of God, is found only in Hellenistic texts, Greek texts. He does overlook one, and that's the Psalms of Solomon 17.3, where the exact phrase occurs there, and it is a Palestinian text, but whatever. Is his point valid? Well, I'm not too sure about that. In the scriptures themselves, we have reference, for example, to the kingdom of Yahweh in 1 Chronicles 28.5, 2 Chronicles 13.8. God speaks of his kingdom in 1 Chronicles 17.14. And in other passages in, Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible, God's kingdom is referred to using personal pronouns, like my kingdom or his kingdom, Psalms 22:28 and 103:19 and 145:11 to 13, for example, as well as a few other places in Scripture. So, I, I questioned Professor Mack's uh, claim at the very beginning because the idea of God having a kingdom seems to be understood in Scripture itself, and the exact phrase "Hey Basileia Tufeu," the kingdom of God in Greek is in fact found in a Palestinian text, Psalms of Solomon 17, which goes on to talk about the coming son of David who will make things right. So there's a linkage then between the kingdom of God and the messianic expectation of the son of David. However, the Dead Sea Scrolls help clarify this matter, I think, very much. In the War Scroll, for example, 1QM, we read, And to the God of Israel shall be the kingdom. And by the saints of his people he, will he display might. Or, for example, and elsewhere in the war scroll, you, O God, resplendent in the glory of your kingdom. That's column 12, line 7. So the idea of God's kingdom seems to be understood in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. And there are other texts that we could also cite. <clears throat> but the songs of the Sabbath sacrifice, 4Q, 400, 401, 402, 403, 404, and 405, these texts contain numerous references to God's kingdom, his lofty kingdom, the beauty of your kingdom, the praiseworthiness of your kingdom among the holiest of the holy ones. We will declare his kingdom, and on it goes, kingdom, 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 always in reference to God's kingdom. There are numerous references, more than two dozen of these references in these scrolls. And what is interesting about it is this kingdom is understood very much in a heavenly, supernatural, transcendent sense. 
And it does provide, I think, a meaningful backdrop against which Jesus' own proclamation of the kingdom in first century Jewish Palestine would be understood. And so I see no validity at all in an appeal to Hellenism or to philosophers, as Professor Mack, in fact, does, in order to clarify the idea of the kingdom of God, as if Jewish people hearing this would think, what does this mean? I don't understand it. Perhaps it's some sort of a borrowed uh, idea from philosophers. That really doesn't stand, and the scrolls, I think, help clarify this. So we have the idea in Scripture already, and it's clear that the idea is current in Hebrew and in Aramaic in Jesus' day and in Palestine. So the Hellenism uh, theory I find unnecessary, unhelpful, and quite possibly misleading. The third example is CD, that is the Cairo-Damascus document. Why is it called that? It's really the Damascus document. It is a document that talks about the community fleeing to the wilderness and taking refuge in Damascus. Most scholars think that's not literal, probably some sort of a cipher, some sort of symbolic meaning. It's called the Cairo Damascus document because this was actually the first of the Dead Sea Scrolls that we discovered, and we didn't discover it in the Dead Sea area at all. It was discovered in Cairo 103 years ago in a synagogue in Geniza, 1896, a Geniza which contained many books that had not yet been properly buried. That's what really a Geniza is. Jewish books, when finished, were simply thrown out into the trash. That was not the way you treat scripture or any other sacred book. The book was simply retired, put in a Geniza, and there it sat awaiting a proper burial. That is why many rabbinic works we, or I should say we have very few rabbinic works dating from antiquity because they were all given, a, well, shall I say, a good Christian burial? Well, that doesn't quite sound right. But anyway, they were taken out and buried, and of course then they disintegrate. But the books in the Cairo Geniza of this old synagogue were forgotten. There was some sort of remodeling, and somebody forgot all about the old Geniza, and there it sat for centuries and have... This Geniza has released to us countless treasures which to this very day have only hardly been uh, cataloged and studied. And in, among these treasures with this interesting document, a dozen or so columns of Hebrew text talking about fleeing to Damascus, hiding out in the wilderness, and so on. And some scholars speculated that maybe this writing has something to do with that interesting sect called the Essenes that Josephus, the Jewish historian, talked about, and Philo talks about, and one or two other writers of antiquity talk about. But it was only a guess. Then when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the late 40s, and a whole series of caves found, 11 in all, from 1947 to 1956, when we actually found in caves four and five fragments of the same Damascus document, the theory was confirmed, even though it was a half a century before we could confirm it. Yes, the Damascus document found in Cairo is of Essene origin, and now we have fragments of it along with other Essenic writings found in the caves near the Dead Sea, some of the caves which you have seen. Now here's an interesting passage, and I think the, uh, the, the uh, scrolls, or in this case the Damascus document, can shed some light on it. If we look at Luke chapter 10, we have a passage where Jesus is asked by a legal authority how he might inherit eternal life. So the passage I'm going to look at is Luke 10, 25 to 29. Behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, Well, what is written in the law? How do you read? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered right. Do this and you will live. Most interpreters agree that that last statement, do this 
and you will live is in fact an allusion to Leviticus 18.5. The whole verse reads, You shall therefore keep my statutes and walk in them. Doing this, a man shall live. I am the Lord. Doing this, you will live. Leviticus 18.5. Now, if we go back to Leviticus 18.5 and read the full context, we discover that what God is teaching the people of Israel through Moses is that if the covenant is obeyed, the people will have a long life in the promised land. There is no discussion of eternal life. Just life in the land. Has Jesus misunderstood scripture? Has he, has he forgotten what the real question was? The legal expert had asked him, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He didn't say, What must I do to guarantee ongoing life in Israel? He wants to know what he must do to gain eternal life. And then Jesus assures him that if he does these principal commandments, love God with everything that he has, and love his fellow neighbor as himself, then, if he does this, he will have life. And he alludes to Leviticus 18.5. So what is the explanation? Well, the scrolls shed light on this. The scrolls suggest that in Jesus' time, Leviticus 18.5 was understood not only to promise life in this life, <coughs> life in the promised land, but, but promises life in the world to come. And so I'm reading from column 3, lines 12 through 16, and then jumping to line 20. But when those of them who were left held firm to the commandments of God, he established his covenant with Israel forever, revealing to them hidden things in which all Israel had erred. His holy Sabbaths, his glorious festivals, his righteous laws, his reliable ways the desires of his will, which a man should do and so have life in them. Leviticus 18.5 Those who hold firm to it shall receive everlasting life and all the glory of Adam will be theirs. So this text here, the Damascus document, column 3, attests the view that Leviticus 18.5 could be understood not simply as guaranteeing life in this world, but guaranteeing life to come, or eternal life. Jesus' allusion then to Leviticus 18.5 very likely was understood that way. And so it is likely then that the legal expert who puts the question to him would be satisfied. If you do these things, if you love God with all that you have, and if you love your neighbor as yourself, then if you do this, you will live. And, the, and the, legist, the legalist, the uh, interpreter, accepts that. Of course, now he's concerned with qualifying what it means to be a neighbor. So he asks, who is then my neighbor? And Jesus then goes on to deliver one of his most famous parables, the parable of the Good Samaritan. The whole point of that parable is not an allegory. The whole point of that parable is the Samaritan who showed mercy uh, to the man who had been injured he lives up to the requirements, the neighbor requirements, the second of the great commandments. He has fulfilled the law. He has life in the world to come. The third example is 4Q500, the vineyard text. And again, we'll, we'll turn to a passage in the Gospels and begin there and, and trace out the meaning of it. And oh, by the way, um, if you look up Leviticus 18.5 in the Aramaic version called the Targum, the expanded version, a very interpretive translational expansion of the Hebrew Bible into Aramaic, you will discover, I believe in uh, all of the extant Targums to Leviticus 18.5, every one of them understands Leviticus 18.5 as promising life in this life and in the world to come. But the D Damascus document is our earliest attestation of that interpretation, an interpretation apparently understood by Jesus also. Now I'm looking at Mark 12 and, and Jesus' well-known parable of the wicked vineyard tenants. Mark 12, 
1 through 12. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and let it out to tenants and went into another country. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants to, to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again he sent to them another servant. They wounded him in the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed, and so on with many others. Some they beat, and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The very stone which the builders rejected has become a, the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they tried to arrest him, the they being the scribes, the elders, and the ruling priests. But they feared the multitude, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Now what is interesting here is Jesus' parable, the parable of the wicked vineyard tenants, is based upon the parable of the vineyard in Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. And if you read that parable, you discover that the parable does not target the priests or, or the elders or the scribes. The parable of the vineyard in Isaiah 5 simply makes blanket judgment against all the people of Jerusalem. All Israel comes under condemnation for being fruitless, despite the many blessings. The, uh, the parable, for example, begins, Isaiah 5, the first two verses, Let me sing a song for my beloved, a love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He digged it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, and he hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And so, so instead of good quality grapes from which vintage wine could be produced, it produced wild grapes, the kind of grapes that would be sour and bitter and of no real use for producing wine. So the song goes on to say, judge between between my beloved and his vineyard. What more could he have done for the vineyard? And so it then goes on to pronounce judgment. And then, in case the person hearing has somehow missed the point, the prophet concludes that it is the men of Israel, the people, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they are the Lord's vineyard. And they have been fruitless. Instead of justice, there has been murder and injustice. And therefore, the vineyard will be given up and be destroyed. Well, this is not the point Jesus makes with this parable. He uses the parable to begin his own new parable, but he does not find fault with the vineyard itself. That isn't the issue at all in Jesus' parable, the wicked vineyard tenants. The problem in Jesus' parable is that the vineyard keepers, an element not found in Isaiah 5, the caretakers, the farmers of, of the vineyard, they are at fault. But then we conclude in Mark 12, 12, that the hearers, the ruling priests, the scribes, and the elders, they perceive that the parable has been told against them. Instead of simply against all of them. Why didn't they just think, oh yes, I recognize the text. Jesus has alluded to about 10 or 11 words right out of Isaiah 5. Yes, this is a condemnation against the whole people. Uh huh. But that's not what they think. He's speaking to us. Now, why is this? Why do they assume this? Well, one interpreter suggested that if we look at the Targum again, that is the Aramaic paraphrase of the Hebrew Bible, the Aramaic paraphrase of Isaiah, we notice something very interesting. 
In that paraphrase of Isaiah 5, there is a narrowing of focus, a narrowing of focus away from the people to the temple, to the cultists established in Jerusalem. They are at fault. In fact, it's observed that instead of referring to a tower being built, there's a reference instead to the sanctuary. And instead of a reference to the wine vat, there's a reference to the altar. So it looks like then Jewish interpretation allegorizes what is already a semi-allegory in the first place, but allegorizes more fully the Isaiah 5 passage. So that there is a cultic orientation and narrowing. It isn't the people of Israel that have been bad. It's in fact the temple establishment. The people in charge of God's sanctuary and God's altar, they are at fault. However, I've appealed to the Targum in this case. I can just imagine someone like, uh, say, Professor Joseph Fitzmaier or someone else, and I mention his name in particular because he has raised an objection, saying, now, wait a minute, you can't use the Isaiah Targum. It's too late. The, the, these traditions are probably second or third century, and some of the traditions are later still. How can you appeal to this Aramaic paraphrase and say, this is the way it would be understood in the early first century. Well, that's a good criticism. Well, Qumran to the rescue. 4Q500 alludes to Isaiah 5 also. And it too seems to equate Isaiah 5 with the temple. The text reads, and I'll just, it's, it really, there's not one complete sentence but there are six lines on this fragment, lines two through seven, that we can partially read. I'll read you just a few of the lines. Line three, a wine vat built among stones, the gate of the holy heights, your planting in the streams of your glory, the branches of your delights, your vineyard. That's it. Now, I think what this illustrates so delightfully is here we have a text from Qumran about this size, not one complete sentence, and yet it's decisive in this particular passage, in this particular debate. <coughs> Rabbinic interpretation understands Isaiah 5 not only in terms of the tower equally the temple and the wine vat equally the altar, but it also talks about this tradition, <coughs> eschatological tradition of streams that issue forth from the altar that lead to fruition throughout the land. Well, 4Q500 alludes to that. 4Q500 apparently understands the holy height that's in reference to the temple, the, the altar uh, built, a vat built among the stones, the gate of the holy height. So we have Isaiah 5, but it's being understood in temple language and the streams of your glory, again reflecting this uh, tradition of the temple, and someday in the future when it's blessed of God, these streams, these fructifying streams will issue forth. And then of course the final line, line seven, your vineyard. So now it is conceded by Fitzmaier and others, that, well, okay, maybe the Aramaic tradition of the Targum is in fact, in this instance, relevant because a text from Qumran, 4Q500, that dates to about 50 BC, understands Isaiah 5 evidently in the same way. Not necessarily negative. There's, you know, it, maybe it is negative, but there's not enough text to know. But it does apparently understand Isaiah 5 as having to do with the temple. And that's the point, because Jesus apparently understands Isaiah 5 as having something to do with the temple. And the ruling priests understand it that way too. And so they realize that indeed, by appealing to Isaiah 5 and telling his parable, he's talking to them and not simply to all of the people. Then just one final point. Jesus concludes by appealing to Psalm 118, verses 22 to 23. Have you not read this scripture? The very stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This passage in the Aramaic tradition is uh, the, the son which the builders has rejected, or the child which the builders has rejected, has become the head of the corner. Psalm 118 in the Aramaic tradition is explicitly Davidic. 
And it tells of the rejected son of Jesse, the rejected son, who later would be accepted by the priests. And so this, I think, helps strengthen our argument that Jesus is familiar with the Aramaic interpretation of Isaiah and of Psalm 118, and the Aramaic interpretation of both helps him weld both texts together in the telling of this parable. 4Q500 helps justify these appeals to the target because 4Q500 shows that this temple association, this temple interpretation of Isaiah 5, is in fact pre-Jesus and isn't simply a later coincidence uh, that, that we really should not appeal to. The next example is 4Q285. And this will be our last one, and there will be time for questions and discussion. 4Q285 is a very intriguing text, and there was a great deal of controversy about it when it first became known a few years ago. The relevant portion reads, and there's an allusion to uh, Isaiah 10, 34, that's the last verse of Isaiah 10, and then it goes on to refer to parts of Isaiah 11, 1 to 5, and it's a messianic passage. Just as it is written in the book of Isaiah the prophet, and the thickets of the forest shall be cut down with an axe, and Lebanon with its majestic trees will fall, a shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and the branch shall grow out of its roots. Okay, just as it's written. And the quotation here is Isaiah 10.34 and 11.1. The commentary now is provided by 4Q285. This is the branch of David. Then all the forces of Belial shall be judged, and the king of the Ketim, shall stand for judgment, and the prince of the congregation, the branch of David, will have him put to death. Then all Israel shall come out with timbrels and dancers, and the high priest shall order them to cleanse their bodies from the guilty blood of the corpses of the Katim. Who are the Katim? The Romans. What is happening here? It is a prediction that the day will come when there will be a great battle. And the king of the Katim, now who would he be? He would be the Roman emperor himself. And he will go head to head and toe to toe in battle with the prince of the congregation. And who is he? The branch of David, prophesied by Isaiah 11.1. 1. And the falling of Lebanon, the collapse of the great one, that's the prediction of the destruction of the king of the Katim, the Roman emperor. So this text this is a very interesting text. In visions, the, in the final messianic war, the Messiah himself squaring off with the Roman emperor and then killing him. Now there was some distracting commotion and controversy over this text. Uh, some of you perhaps remember uh, seven or so years ago, seven, yeah, six or seven years ago, some headlines coming out saying a Qumran text has been discovered that, that foretells the crucifixion of Jesus. But one put it that way. Another, uh, a slain Messiah text, and so on. And this was based on mispronouncing the Hebrew. As you know, the Hebrew that we saw on the screen, all we were looking at are consonants. And the, the vowels are supplied. You have to vocalize those consonants. This, of course, allows for the possibility of reading the text a little differently. And so the text, have him put to death, all of that actually is just a single word. And depending on how you vocalize it, you could change it. Instead of the branch of David killing him, putting him to death, it could be they will kill the branch of David. So you could have two very different readings. And so when this Hebrew text became available in 1991 and 92, there was a flurry of activity as some tried to argue that this text envisioned the coming of a Messiah who would be slain by the Romans. 
And so some said, oh, well, this text must then be a Christian text talking about Jesus. Or maybe a prophetic text anticipating the coming of a Messiah who would die at the hands of the Romans. So there's quite a lot of controversy. The problem is, is they had mistranslated the later part of it. The part that says, all Israel will come out with timbrels and dancers. It was, it was translated variously as, all Israel will come out with woundings and beatings. But, it, but this one was rather easy to solve. Just take all the letters involved and run them through the computer. There are two texts in the Hebrew Bible. One of them is Exodus 15. Two texts where this combination occurs, and it's in reference to tambourines or timbrels and women dancing. Beating or dancing, that is the feet striking the floor. And the one example in Exodus 15 is where Miriam, Moses' sister, and all the women come out beating tambourines and dancing, celebrating the destruction of Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. And so uh, this, this uh, corrected reading was recognized by 1995 or so. Hey, wait a minute. Israel is coming out with tambourines and dancing. Would Israel do that if the Messiah had just been killed by the Roman Emperor? I think not. And so that helped settle the question of how the vocalization of that word kill, how it should be vocalized. That, and there was no uh, direct object indicator with the word branch of David, which is what we would expect. I don't want to get into a lot of grammar. So there, there were other reasons for why we thought that it's really the branch of David who kills the prince of the Katim and not the other way around. But getting the last part of the translation right, timbrels or tambourines and dancing or dancers, getting that right helped settle it. So what then do we have here in 4Q285? We have a picture, a very traditional picture, of the expected Messiah who is a warrior and who will come and attack and destroy the Roman Emperor. This helps explain why Jesus was viewed with such misgivings and why when he is handed over to Pontius Pilate, the governor, he's handed over as a king, as a potential rival to Caesar, as a serious threat. And why Pontius Pilate should be therefore expected to have him put to death. Because messianic expectation is not looking forward to someone who will be a martyr, Messianic expectation looks forward to someone who will drive Rome out and indeed even slay the Roman emperor. All right, I'll bring this to a, a conclusion. I want to just say a few words about 11Q Melchizedek in relationship uh, to uh, what has just been said about 4Q 285. In 11Q Melchizedek, column 2, we have a very interesting interpretation of Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 is the passage that Jesus quotes at the beginning of his Nazareth sermon in Luke 4, 16 to 13. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to do this, to do that, etc., to declare the acceptable day of the Lord. Jesus goes on, though, to warn that congregation that his message, paradoxically, will not be acceptable. And that's a deliberate wordplay in the text. The prophet is to come to declare the acceptable, the dectos, year of the Lord, and yet this prophet will not be, and his message will not be acceptable, dectos, to the people to whom he preaches it. And why is that? Because they expect messianic blessings for them and messianic judgment for others. And this would be completely consistent with 4Q285. The Messiah has come. It will be blessings for us, but for outsiders like the Romans, it will be judgment. 11Q Melchizedek understands Isaiah 61 the same way. Not the way Jesus understands it. And so what we have here then is, a, is an illustration of contrast. The scrolls you see can shed light on Jesus' teaching because the scrolls sometimes teach the same thing. We saw that yesterday with 4Q521, the works of the Messiah. All Heaven and earth will obey his Messiah and all that's in them. 
When the Messiah comes, what happens? The blind regain their sight. The, 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 the wounded are healed. The dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them. But the scrolls can also shed light on Jesus' teaching by contradicting Jesus' teaching, by teaching the very thing he doesn't teach, by holding to the very views he sometimes criticizes. And so it has been commented before that when Jesus quoted Isaiah 61, 1-2, in his Nazareth sermon, he left out one very interesting line, the day of vengeance of our God. That's the line that 11Q Melchizedek not only does not leave out, but seems to relish. The sons of light eagerly await the day of vengeance. So the very part of the verse Jesus leaves out, the vengeance element, that's the part that 11Q Melchizedek emphasizes when it envisions the day that's coming. So 11Q Melchizedek is very similar in its expectation as 4Q285, the anticipation of a Messiah who will come and it will be payback time. And the Romans are going to get it. And indeed, the Messiah is expected to kill the leader of the Romans on the field of battle. Jesus' own message is different and he shocks his contemporaries by suggesting that messianic blessings aren't just for you. Messianic blessings are even for our enemies like Nahum and the Syrians. And the audience was scandalized. I will conclude there. Thank you.